Link TV, connecting you to the world. Link TV is viewer supported. Watch more at linktv.org. Today on Earth Focus, the future of the oceans. Renowned oceanographer, explorer, and author, Dr. Sylvia Earle, shares her insights with Miles Benson, coming up on Earth Focus. Sylvia Earle, you've led a life of remarkable adventure and accomplishment in and under the ocean. What was it about the ocean that first grabbed you? Well, as a child, I did what kids do, ask questions. Kids are natural explorers, and I was no different. We moved to Florida when I was 12, my backyard, the Gulf of Mexico. I knew from the earliest time that I can remember that I wanted to do something with plants and animals, with critters. Most of them are in the ocean. So it was logical as a biologist that I would become a marine biologist, an oceanographer, um, ecologist, whatever you call it. I was just naturally drawn to the sea. What's happening to that world you've come to know? I tell people sometimes that I come from a different planet because the planet that I came from <laughs> is very different from the planet that I live on now. Think about the ocean, 90% of the big fish and many of the small ones too are simply gone. We've destroyed undersea environments, habitats. About half the coral reefs are either gone or they're in a state of great decline. It's disturbing to see how fast we have influenced the nature of nature, land and sea, in such a short period of time. And we're not really appreciating that our lives depend on maintaining the integrity of our life support system, an atmosphere that after four and a half billion years is just right. Since 1950, according to an analysis that came out in the fall of 2010, in Science Magazine, 40% of the phytoplankton in the sea is gone since 1950, gone. Most of the oxygen that we breathe comes from the ocean, largely from these microscopic bacteria and other photosynthetic organisms. Now, we can still breathe, <laughs> but what we're doing is undermining the integrity of systems that yield what we need to live. What's more important than that? Our economy, our health, our security, or being alive? Are we that close to the death of the ocean? I don't know what a total death of the ocean is exactly, but if I think in terms of something that I can visualize, here's this big vat of milk, and you're dropping vinegar into it. Ka-dink, 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 it doesn't go sour all at once, but there's a point beyond which everything changes. Everything changes, you've gone so far. By mid-century, according to the projections, there will be no more commercial fishing because the populations will be so depressed. They're already really on a state of, of freefall decline because we somehow have had the notion that no matter what we do, the, that the natural systems are so resilient that we can take and take and take and they will magically rebound. People are talking about the way we are influencing the basic chemistry of the planet. One of the big things that is beginning to emerge in the general press, not just scientific press, is we're causing the ocean to become more acidic. Why should we worry about that? If anybody has a swimming pool or a, a home aquarium, you know that you constantly look at the pH. You don't want it to become so acid that it, it is not healthy for the creatures that are there or you. So. Huh. We, through excess carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, are stretching the limits of what the ocean can absorb. You say we're trashing it, but some people think that, no, it's not us, it's just a natural cycle. But you don't believe that, do you? Oh, there are natural cycles, no question about it. Every day is different. But we have imposed our impacts on the natural systems in a way that no other creature on the planet has done in the past or <laughs> can't imagine anything that could be as drastic as what we're doing in a comprehensive way to change the nature of nature. Flip side of that that is cause for 
greater concern for anybody who cares about people, and I'm certainly one of those, it's that nature may be letting us slip through her fingers. That the changes that are taking place as a consequence of our actions are so altering our life support system, we need to worry. Like no other creatures on the planet, we have the power to understand these things and to do something about it. You saw all of this coming, and in the early 90s, you were the chief scientist at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Did you call this to the attention of the policymakers? And if so, what was the reaction of the administration? 20 years ago, much that I now know, I did not know then. In fact, when I was chief scientist at NOAA, a little piece of paper came across my desk, 19. 91. It said that 90% of the bluefin tuna in the North Atlantic, according to the fishermen's own records, were gone. My reaction was, what are we trying to do? Exterminate them? Because if we are, we're doing a great job. We've only got 10% left to go. I raised this question at a big fisheries meeting. And that's when they started calling me the Sturgeon General because I was making such a fuss about the fish. But to me, it didn't make sense. Now we know we need to rethink our policies, but we seriously need to think. Humans are endowed with the power of knowing. We can see that we are the vectors of change. And going back to the 50s and 60s, and even into the 70s, and even now, there's this attitude driven by ignorance of, of not really understanding that, that A, that we can have a difference, make a difference, or B, that it matters back to us. You haven't given up the fight. Tell us about Mission Blue. Mission Blue is the name given to a movement, I suppose you could call it, that came as a consequence of, of a wish that I made when an organization called TED, Technology Entertainment Design, the TED Conference, gave me the prize in 2009 and with it the wish and their willingness to back the wish. It had to be a big wish, a wish that could change the world. And my wish was to ignite public support for an awareness of what's happening to the ocean, to develop a, a campaign, if you will, of making people understand our connection to the sea, what we're doing to it, and in the end point, to protect the blue heart of the planet by establishing protected areas. I call these places hope spots. Right now, around the world, more than 5,000 areas have been designated for protection in one form or another. Management areas as sanctuaries, uh, monuments, or reserves that, that are truly fully protected. My wish was to inspire people around the world to use their powers to communicate, use their powers to educate, use their powers to bring about policies that will protect the ocean as if our lives depend on it, because actually they do. Sylvia Earle, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Link TV is the only U.S. network dedicated to global and national news, uncompromising documentaries, and diverse cultural programs. Programs which connect you to the world. To learn more, visit linktv.org.